Good morning, welcome. Come and take a seat. If you're joining us on site, big welcome. And if you're joining us online, please say hi in the chat. We'd love to connect with you. It's great to be together. My name's Sam, and I'm really looking forward to finishing up our series that we've been looking at throughout this whole month of November. Now, if you've been journeying with us, you know we've been uh, looking at a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church that he helped set up in a place called Philippi in ancient Greece. And Paul's a historically verified figure, and Philippi is a, a real place you can go and visit. And if you look back a few weeks, we had a picture of some of the ruins of that city. So we're looking at a letter written by someone who really lived, who wrote to a real group of people in a real place. And we've been exploring all of the different themes and things that Paul wrote in this letter. I mean, this letter must have been really important to the people who received it. Let's just think about that for a moment because they obviously got Paul's letter. I don't know how many pages it was, whether it was written on A4, who knows. Uh, but it must have been something that they treasured so much. I mean, as we read through it now, we start to unpick and discover uh, all the different things that he was uh, so joyful about, about how they carried on from when he helped set up that church. Ten years later, he's writing them, and he's so full of joy about how they're carrying on in their pursuit of following Jesus from when he first started that. And as he's written this letter, it must have been something that they really treasured, that was really special and important to them. And why do I say that? Because they must have held on to that. They must have passed that on down through generations. I mean, in previous times, it would have been through oral traditions, how uh, sayings and things would have been passed on. There would have been so many people who had the ability to write and to do the scribing and make copies of things. But it must have been something really important and significant to the early church. And the reason of that is because it survived. If it was just a sort of a, you know, how are you doing, wish you were here kind of letter, or, or just something that they thought, well, that's nice, but, you know, we haven't seen him for a long time, we've kind of forgotten about him, and we're just kind of getting on with our own thing, then it, they would not have held on to it. It would not have become such an important part of, uh, of the writings that eventually got put together into our, our modern English Bible that we have now. So we have to remember that at the time when we, when we look at these different letters and these different books that we call in our Bible that have been put together, this started out life as a letter, a letter from Paul to this community of believers that he was so passionate about, he was so excited about, he was so full of joy to write to them and to encourage them on in their journey, so much so that they held on to that, they went back to that, they shared that with other churches no doubt and as the, the church began to expand through the first few centuries it became such a recognised and important letter that it was compiled and, and chosen as one of those things that ought to go into the New Testament, into our modern Bible. So we have to remember that, that these are, the, the, where these started out life, they didn't start out as just another book in our sort of dusty Bible, but it was a, a letter that people received. And I was just imagining today, uh, if we received this kind of uh, letter from Paul today, that we might kind of drop in into our inbox um, and uh, what it might look like if we received that uh, from Paul. You see, here we go, it just dropped in. In fact, last night it dropped in from obviously a verified account. There's no, no fake news going on here. But imagine if that dropped in and we had this, this letter from Paul. And if we go on to the next one, you know, here's, he starts to write out to us. I mean, how would we hold on and treasure it? I mean, we might think this is funny, but this is, I think this is part of the experience of this early church. Someone, and, they, and again, it's not just being put through their letterbox with a, maybe with a postage still needs to be paid, uh, slip with it, you know. This was a letter that had to be taken by someone. It had to be hand delivered. And it wasn't just round the corner. We know from reading the early parts of Paul's letter that this was a long and dangerous journey. The person who, uh, first of all, went to see Paul, he took a gift from the Philippian church. They knew Paul was under arrest. He was under house arrest. Uh, he couldn't work, but he, he didn't receive anything to, to have food or to subsist on. So they knew his situations. So they, they'd taken a collection and sent a generous gift. So. 
uh, Epaphroditus, this member of their church community, had undertaken this big, dangerous journey to deliver the gift. And then he returns, uh, we think, with Paul's letter back to the church. So it was a big deal. It wasn't just something kind of dropping in to their inbox. And if you missed the first few parts uh, of this series, you can catch up with all those on our YouTube channel, but we've been taking a, a whistle-stop tour through this letter of Paul's, and we're going to be carrying on and wrapping up our series this morning. But before we get to that, you might be wondering why I've got several pairs of rather old, uh, not too smelly, uh, sets of running shoes here. Well, I'll give you a bit of a history of these shoes, because these shoes have been a few places with me. So back in 2007, um, my friend at the time, uh, we just finished uh, walking the Pennine Way, and he said, now that we've done all this exercise, why don't we sign up for the London Marathon next year? I thought, what a great idea. So little did I know what I was getting into. Um, this was the first marathon I'd ever uh, attempted. Um, and these were the pair of shoes that I got from the local running shop. I still have them. Uh, and uh, I went out many... Uh, many early mornings and dark nights. See, the, the, one of the hard things, I mean, there's lots of hard things about running a marathon, but London Marathon is normally in April, and that means training starts at the beginning of January. The least light, horrible weather, it's just not a pleasant experience getting out there and doing the training through those winter months. And so that can be you know, one of the big challenges. But as you set off, uh, uh, the, the, the gun goes off and you finally get out of the starting line because there's like 35,000 people uh, trying, to, trying to get going. So it's a, it's a little bit of a waiting start. But as you start out, uh, everyone's full of excitement. There's crowds lining the streets. You think this is going to be fantastic. This is going to be so exciting and there's so much buzz around you. And so you start going past these uh, huge, they have these huge mile markers. So you get past mile one and feeling great. I mean, hopefully feeling pretty good at this point. Uh, and you, the, through the first few miles, you know, you see these mile markers coming up and you think, yes, this is going well. This is encouraging. And then about halfway, 13 miles, is where you get to cross Tower Bridge. And up to that point, it's uh, mostly, as long as nothing's gone terribly wrong, uh, all full of excitement and enjoyment. But after that point, I distinctly remember this, you come over the bridge and then you turn right. And it's all difficult from there on. Partly because of the distance, I mean, you're now into getting into some of the hardest bits of the, the, the race. Um, but also where you go is down into Docklands, there's tall buildings, there's lots of shadows, there's usually less people in those long miles. And, and those mile markers, rather than becoming sort of excited to see, you still think, goodness me, how many are still left to go? Uh, and uh, as it would happen in April, the weather can be very unpredictable. And in 2007, my first marathon, it turned out to be a stinking hot day, which did not suit me at all. But I persevered and I carried on and I made it through. Uh, but not content with my, my result, I returned again a few years later in new running shoes, which obviously would make all the difference. And again, as luck would have it, it was another very hot day. Uh, so I, again, I persevered and got through. And sort of having clocked up a couple of marathons, I thought it's time to investigate a different sport. And in fact, I thought, well, why limit it to one sport when you could do three all at once in triathlon? You know, swim, bike, and run, that's all you have to do. It seems quite straightforward. Now, over the next few years, I kind of did different varying distance races and worked up to uh, a half Ironman, which sounds like it was only half, you know, it can't be that hard. Um, and uh, so in 2017, I entered what's called the Gauntlet. It sounds very scary, but it's at Hever Castle in Kent. Uh, it's a very hilly part of uh, Kent in the High Weald. And again, as luck would have it, it was July, so it shouldn't be too much of a surprise, but again, it was a very hot day. So I set off the swim, it's a 1.9 kilometer swim down this river, which is lovely. And then you set off on the bike course, it's 80 kilometers, two laps. 
of some horrible hills. And I remember coming off uh, that bike thinking, oh my goodness, I don't know how I'm going to get round uh, the rest of this course. Well, I put on my trusty shoes, which obviously made me go very fast, um, and uh, off I went. Um, and, you know, running itself can be amazing. I mean, maybe it's not your thing, but certainly through training, there's certainly days when I've been out when you just feel like I could just run forever. I mean, it's just a lovely feeling. It doesn't happen all the time, uh, but it's a great feeling. But other times, particularly in races, you get to that point, you think, oh, I could just do with stopping for a few minutes. You know, a drink station coming up, oh, maybe this is a perfect moment. If I just stop and walk for a minute, I'll just feel better. But actually what you find is as soon as you stop, everything starts to seize up. And, uh, uh, and the difficulty of getting going again becomes ever more increasing. Now, since February this year, I've taken up a new sport and it does require uh, different, different footwear, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, it requires dedication. It requires patience. It's always every day. You can't miss a day if you take this up because uh, it does require uh, you being out multiple times in the day. And this is the new footwear that is required for the, the Olympic sport of dog walking. I can tell you it's a very, very good sport to be going. It's definitely not one that you can just stop uh, and give up part way round. But, uh, but that aside, um, we'll see how that links in. But, I want to come back to Paul's letter because he talks about what it's like to run the race of life. When we feel that temptation to stop, to give up, when we feel like we could just do with a break, we could just do with taking a detour perhaps. And so we're going to look at that um, and what Paul is saying to us about how we follow Jesus uh, this morning. So we're going to carry on uh, up in chapter 3 of uh, his letter and he carries on by saying this I'm not saying that I have this all together that I have it made but I'm well on my way reaching out for Christ who has so wondrously reached out for me friends don't get me wrong by no means do I count myself an expert in all of this but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. And the first thing that strikes me is how Paul's saying, Christ, who has wondrously reached out for me, how Jesus made the first move. And Paul knows that from his story. If we read about his story, and Paul was previously called Saul. I mean, he was a, a church hater. He wasn't just an intellectual, he was a man of action. And he did not like the followers, the earlier followers of Jesus. In fact, he was breathing out murderous threats. He was chasing down the Christians. He was having them arrested and thrown into jail and even some of them having them stoned. And he viewed this new upstart religion as a complete affront to all that he believed to be true, all that he so carefully uh, followed and all the rules that he kept and did so well at. But he had an encounter with Jesus. Jesus made the first move. And as Paul was on a journey, God spoke to him and asked him, why are you persecuting me? See, I don't think Paul had twigged what was actually going on. He thought he was defending God. God was actually saying, why are you you're actually persecuting me? And that made a big change in Paul's life. He made a complete 180 degree shift in the direction of his life. He was still just as zealous as he was before, but the direction he was going changed completely. And his name changed to Paul and he started helping to build the church. And Joel talked about this earlier, how strange it might have been that he was coming to communities that previously he turned up at and everyone would have been terrified 
at the thought that Saul and his, uh, his minions and his henchmen were coming round the corner. But now somehow he was coming in a completely different spirit. How is that possible? How is it that he could have gone from hating and destroying the church, not just in his thinking but in his actions, to now he wanted to build and plant new churches? It's possible because Jesus reached out to him first. So we have to remember that in our lives. We might think that we chose this. Actually, we just responded to his invitation. And if you haven't responded to his invitation yet, I'm just letting you know that he's, he's offering that. He's making that available. Christ has made the first move. So Paul knew that he had been taken hold of God for something, for a purpose. And he also goes on to say, it's sort of an echo of this, the previous kind of section of his writing, saying, I haven't got it all together. I mean, if anyone could have said they might have it all together, I think it was Paul. He, he previously reels off this list of his achievements. You know, it's not marathon running, but maybe you know, his list of uh, religious achievements, why he was so qualified. And yet he says here, I don't have, I'm not an expert. I haven't got it all together. And why is that so encouraging? Because he says we don't need to be an expert either. We don't need to have it all together. But what do we need to do? Keep our eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward. Where? To Jesus. So he's keeping his focus on Jesus. And what he wants to say to us is keep going. Keep going. Don't give up. Keep going. Keep going. It's not about the finish time. It is about finishing. I'm often running and I'm not turning back. I wonder whether we would count ourselves as being off and running. Do we think we got out of the starting blocks with following Jesus? Or maybe we've set off at a high pace but found it's kind of hard going. It gets tiring after a while. And the temptation to stop and give in is big. But Paul encourages us, and not just through his words, through his very life, through every action that he's doing. Remember at this time, he is in chains, he's under arrest. He could have just thought, wow, oh, what can I do? There's, there's not much I can do now. They've got me. But no, he keeps on going. He keeps on finding ways to encourage those, to say, I'm still running. I'm not turning back. That was his mission, to keep encouraging the churches he established. He wanted them to not give up. I wonder if we want everything that God has for us, whether we are following in Paul's example of not turning back, of keeping our eye on the goal, or maybe we think, well, let's just hedge our bets a little bit. Maybe we don't want to miss out. But I look at people like Paul, and I think, does it seem like he had a life where he missed out? All that he left behind. I mean, he was a top Pharisee. He was held in great high regard and respect for all of his achievements. And yet he turned his back on all of that. He left all that behind. But did he live as if he seemed like he was missing out? I don't think so. I don't see that when I read about Paul's life. And when I read about the life of Jesus, I don't get a sense that he was missing out either. I don't get the sense that, well, instead of maybe he could have carried on his carpentry career and built some kind of business empire, or maybe just passed his days away in quietness and peace. I don't see that. In fact, I see the opposite. I see that their cups were full because they poured themselves out for others. Do we want easy street? I don't think there is an easy street. There's no easy street in life. Just ask yourself. Ask anyone around you. 
Is it really true? I don't believe there is. The choice isn't between a tough life of trying to follow Jesus and do everything right versus just kind of do whatever you want. I think the choice is about a life that's fulfilled following Jesus versus a life that becomes very small and very self-centered and self-focused. So Paul carries on with his writing. Stick with me, friends. Keep track of those you see running the same course, headed for this same goal. There are many out there taking other paths, choosing other goals, and trying to get you to go along with them. I've warned you of them many times, sadly, and I'm having to do it again. All they want is Easy Street. They hate Christ's cross, but Easy Street is a dead-end street. Those who live there make their bellies their gods. Belches are their praise. All they can think of is their appetites. There's some nice imagery there. <laughs> Stick with me, friends. He says, keep going. And it's not just a race to run on your own. It's something we run together. Yeah. And let's not get distracted by all these others who are proposing and... and, and and showing perhaps other routes to go down, other paths that we might think are attractive, that we might be tempted into. There's many people running different races with different goals. Their eyes aren't on Jesus. And I think the problem is all these other paths, they always look tempting. They look like they're better or can be than what we're pursuing. And for me, when I look on social media, these are some of the things that I see. And these aren't bad in of themselves, but I see this video here. This, uh, this guy training for an Ironman. The scene before this shows his, uh, his clock in his lounge, 4.15 a.m. I see this guy here, he's wanting to break a 2.45 marathon time, which is extremely challenging. I see these guys building their own home. I'm thinking, well, I'm not doing any of these things. I'm not even close. I don't know what it is that you're looking at and comparing your life to. But these little snapshots, these aren't the whole story. A single image, a blog post, a podcast, a YouTube video. It's easy to look at these things and think, so many people doing better than me. Maybe I need to follow these paths and we can keep scrolling for hours in what I call an unending sea of comparison it just leaves us feeling lacking but I think it's a false comparison you know we can always go and find someone who seems further on and what Paul's saying is don't follow those paths it doesn't mean these things are wrong in of themselves but don't make that your goal make your goal Jesus Paul begs to differ, and so do I. The goal of following Jesus is to become more like the one we follow every day. Paul's so honest, he doesn't claim to be an expert in all of this. He's saying you don't need to be an expert, but what you do need to do is keep going. Don't give up. So this is how Paul concludes this part of his letter. But there's far more to life for us. We're citizens of high heaven. We're waiting the arrival of the Savior, the Master, Jesus Christ, who will transform our earthly bodies into glorious bodies like his own. He'll make us beautiful and whole with the same powerful skill by which he's putting everything as it should be, under him and around him. So wherever you are on your journey of following Jesus, whether you're just looking in, inquiring, exploring, Paul's telling us there's more to life for us. We're to be citizens of high heaven. We belong to a different place, a different land, a different people. See, the promise is that Jesus will transform us day by day as we keep making that decision to surrender to him, 
And hopefully as we try to say yes more than no, as we follow him, it's not easy. Just like running that race. There's many moments when we might want to stop, when we might want to go and choose another path that seems easier. But I tell you, those paths are not easier at all. As Paul says, they lead to dead ends. So what have we been looking at through this whole letter? What is it that Paul has been saying to us through it all? Well, he wrote this to that church, but so much of it, I find, is so relevant for us as we search through, as we read it over and over again, as we understand what he was saying to the church at that time in that place. What does it mean to live a Jesus-centered life? It starts with being thankful. That's what we looked at in the first part. Then we went on to think about what focusing on what brings us together. How much do we need that message now more than ever when communities and countries and even across the world we become so divided. There's so many lines drawn. Are you this or that side of the argument or the debate? Paul says focus on what brings you together with Christ at the center. He goes on to remind us to have our confidence should be placed in him, not in ourselves or in our own achievements, because we will let ourselves down. But putting our confidence in Jesus will never be let down. And then in this section of his letter, we want to be reminded to keep going. But what I want to start to close with is thinking about not just keep going on our own, but how do we run the race together? What does it look like? Joel talked about earlier about having a friend you can sit with. But what does it look like to have a friend who we journey with? Well, having uh, spent many years watching uh, professional triathlon on the, on the TV, um, it often comes down to two athletes battling out at the end of the race. They're usually uh, pretty exhausted and you sit there and wonder how they seem to have so much energy left. Uh, in one such race in the Triathlon World Series, it was 2016 in Mexico, and uh, Jonathan Brownlee, GB athlete, very uh, exceptional athlete, um, he was leading the race. And he was uh, looking really strong, only 700 meters left, which might sound like a long way, but after being out for probably an hour and a half already, it wasn't far to go. He was looking strong uh, with only a few turns to go. It'd been a very hot and humid day in Mexico, and uh, he started to weave across the road. And we're just gonna watch a little clip here of what happened next. Johnny has to win and to be sure of taking the title. And right now he seems to have lost control of his legs. And this is worrying. Oh, and he's starting to slow. And there is a little way to go. There's half a K to go. And Johnny is running out of time and is losing. He's losing his sense of direction. This is worrying. Oh, goodness me. This is a horrible sight. Jonathan Brownlee has lost it now and has staggered to a stop at the side of the course. And Alistair's stopped to help him along. And Alistair is going to try and carry his brother home. Dramatic scenes in Cozumel as the Olympic champion carries his younger brother towards the podium. Oh my God, I cannot believe what we are seeing here, Matt. Is this allowed? Is he allowed to help his brother? You know, is that part of the rules? I'm not too sure. We've never seen anything like this before. Unbelievable scenes. Unbelievable scenes in Cosimo. The Brownlee brothers arm in arm, but it's not by way of celebration. Henry Schumann's celebrating. He's going to win this race in Cozumel out of nowhere. 
that we have to be concerned about the health of Jonathan Brownlee and they're not even on the final stretch yet. Schumann wins in Cozumel. The brothers are coming home arm in arm to finish in second and third but Johnny can hardly stand and Alistair is having to drag him across the line and pushing him home, pushing him home for second. Johnny finishes in second. Goodness me, what an incredible... Such an incredible moment in sport. Sometimes we get these windows into what it's like. And I think just such a powerful illustration there. Paul doesn't just say how we're to run the race on our own. He wants us to run together. And just like the brothers did there, I mean, if you know much about them, they're incredibly competitive. <laughs> Alistair would often win more races. He was in sprinting distance of maybe taking first place. And yeah, he chose on those final meters to, to give up that, all that he'd worked for, all that was gonna be his possible glory, his victory. He put that to one side because he saw there was someone he needed to help. Shoulder to shoulder. You see, when one person has the strength, they see someone who's struggling. What do we do? How will we run together? Will we put aside what we want to achieve, what we might want to accomplish? Will we help to carry one another? When we're facing trials, when we're facing challenges and difficulties in uncertainty in our health, When we're jobless or homeless, we've been kicked out, kicked down. When we failed or we've messed things up. When we've been messed up. How will we run together as a people? It's a timeless message from Paul. He's not just saying keep going on your own because we can't. It's too hard. That's why God has set us in a community together. That's why he's created us to be alongside one another. So as we're running and we're struggling or we see someone struggling, we come alongside, we run together. You know, few people remember the winner of that race. Everyone remembers what happened. And the commentator saying, is it even allowed? Who cares? Even if they were disqualified, who cares? Always remember the moment they helped carry his brother over the line. They remember the love of a brother who came alongside, who was willing to put down his own ambition and help carry him. So that's how we want to run this journey together. And as we've looked through this whole or most of this letter, I encourage you to go and read the rest. There's bits we haven't had time to dig into. But what I want to take away is that image how will we run together? Who will be there when you need it? And who will you be there for when they need it? And that is how we live a Christ-centered life. That's what it looks like. And you know what, when we do that, we shine like stars. Because we're not showing off our own greatness. Or if we feel we have no greatness, we've got nothing to show. We actually reflect the greatness of God. How he wants us to run. Yeah. Let's pray. God, I thank you that we still have this incredible letter, the writings from Paul to the early church. And it wasn't just a message for them in that moment, in that time, at that place what was going on in the world then. But you speak to us now through it, God. Help us as we, as we read your word, God, to see the timeless things that you're speaking to us about who you are, yeah. about how we can center our lives on you. And as we've read today, how we should keep going. Help us to keep going. 
but would we not be fooled into being dragged off into other paths, thinking they perhaps look more appealing than the path you've called us to? But would we also remember we have to run together? That there's times when we have to link arms, when we lose control of our our body, as it were, as we lose control, we feel we're losing control of our life. And we have to allow ourselves to be carried. But on the days when we've got the energy and the strength, let us see who we could carry, not who we could overtake and beat. Let us see who we could get alongside to support and encourage. Because that is what Jesus would do. And that's what Paul is encouraging us to do and what he was modeling, what he was wanting to just encourage the church with so much. And that message is us for us today to keep going together. So God, I pray you work in our lives, that people would see how we live and how we run the race with one another and be inspired to find you, Jesus, and then be inspired to follow you because of how we do. Not that we need to be experts. We don't need to have it all sorted. But just as Paul says, we keep our eyes focused on the goal. We're off and running and we're not going back. Help us to run together, Lord. Pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, well, we're gonna be wrapping up there. Thanks for joining us this morning and uh, have a great week. If you've got uh, any children over the road, please make sure to pick them up at 12. Otherwise, you're welcome to stay, have a drink, and uh, chat a bit more. And really looking forward to next week. December is starting. Christmas is coming. And we're looking forward to getting into our Christmas theme then. So have a great week, and we'll see you soon. (laughs) 